true murder. It's a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer. I would also play with you. Yes. Thank you to play with Sam. The Night Stalker. BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. In the late summer of 1969, the nation was transfixed by a series of gruesome murders in the hills of Los Angeles. Newspapers and television programs detailed the brutal flayings of a beautiful actress, 26 years old and eight months pregnant with her first child, as well as a hairstylist, an heiress, a businessman, and other victims. The city of Angels was plunged into a nightmare of fear and dread. In the weeks and months that followed, law enforcement faced intense pressure to solve crimes that seemed to have no connection. Finally, after months of dead ends, false leads, and near misses, Charles Manson and members of his family were arrested. The bewildering trials that followed once again captured the nation and forever secured Manson as a byword for the evil that men do. Drawing upon deep archival research and exclusive personal interviews, including unique access to Manson family parole hearings, former federal prosecutor and Fox News legal analyst Liz Wheel has written a propulsive, page-turning historical thriller of the crimes and manhunt that mesmerized the nation. And in the process, she reveals how the social and political context that gave rise to Manson is eerily similar to our own. The book that we're featuring this evening is Hunting Charles Manson, The Quest for Justice in the Days of Helter Skelter, with my special guests Liz Wheel and Caitlin Rother. Welcome to the program, and thank you very much for agreeing this interview. Liz Wheel and Caitlin Rother. Hi, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. And let's let's get right to this. Um, for all the books that have written about Manson, and uh, Diane Lake published one last year. Mm-hmm. What was the purpose for writing this book? What did you hope to to give the the fans or the people? What was what was left to say? What was the purpose? Well, that's the challenge. This is this is the biggest case ever. Really, when you look at murder cases, it's the most notorious. Like you said, he become Charles Manson became the icon for evil. So we wanted to advance this story, though, as much as we could, because, you know, the, the, the book that everybody says is, you know, sort of the authoritative version, Helter Skelter, that was published in 1974. So there's been many, many years since then that you know, much new information has come out. Lisa and I wanted to advance the story as much as we could and use new information to not only go over what people thought they knew from before, but to also introduce new evidence. When I say new evidence, I mean new, a fresh look at new information that would go back and give a fresh perspective and a new perspective on many of the, the details that had come out previously. And so that's why those parole hearing were very important because the family members who, you know, are still in prison and are trying to get out of prison, they have become more and more forthcoming about details that they were previously unwilling or I don't know if they were willing at the time and Manson said, no, you can't. But I think, you know, at the time they were brainwashed and they were under his control still. And during the trial, they did not testify. So not only were they under his influence, they didn't really get a chance to say anything. And so, you know, there are some people today who still claim that, you know, that they want to get out and, you know, Manson didn't kill anyone and they're just saying these things so they can get out of prison. But there are details that they've said that really add a much clearer picture, a more comprehensive picture of what was really going on in the dynamic in the family. And that's what we presented in this book. Now, what was especially intriguing, as you say, the new parole hearings, the subsequent parole hearings after Helter Skelter was obviously published, and that's what people know of, you offer even more intimate details of the actual murders themselves, and not only the ones that were covered in Helter Skelter, but over and beyond. And I say that for the audience, that even if you thought the details were chilling before, even more chilling, even more detailed, based on the information that you've done in this book, but especially from those parole hearings. Am I correct on that information? 
guess what I'm saying is there there are things that did not come out of the mouths of these women, for example, until a couple of years ago. So, for example, Patricia Krimwinkle, in her 2016 parole hearing, for the first time made an intimate partner battery claim. Now, you know, you hear a lot about, oh, Manson, you know, had sex with these women and there was a lot of LSD and they were just the 60s and free love and all that. Well, no, not just that. He controlled them by fear and intimidation and violence. So she came out and told stories about how he, and I don't remember if this all came out in 2016, but I'm just saying that was when that official claim was made, which was given a name. And that defense wasn't even a defense at the time that these trials happened. It came out years later, spousal battery kind of defense where he beat me and so I was just protecting myself, that kind of thing. She feared for her life and she feared repercussions if she didn't do what he said. And so that was her claim. And so the the parole board actually took it under advisement. They went back and they did some investigation for a few months. They came back and they said, yes, we find that this is true, but no, you still can't get out of prison. It's still not enough of reason to, for us to let you out. So my point is, there is new information that, that has actually come out only in the last few years, even, about what actually happened back then. So you didn't have a complete picture. We feel like we've filled in a lot of those holes be more comprehensive so that you have a better understanding of why did those women stay? Why Not only why did they kill for him, why did they stay in that group? What power did he have over them and how did he operate? Yeah, it explains exactly how it was done, how it, they first were lured or influenced, and then the kinds of people. He was a experienced con man, many years in prison, and so right. he knew who was vulnerable, who knew, he knew who to pick on, didn't he? Right. And not just women, but men, too. Yeah. Now, also, some of the highlights of this book, too, are, well, I say highlights, but I mean, the whole book is a highlight. But some of the things that you're welcome that won't be found anywhere else is that exclusive interviews with Jason Freeman, the son of Manson's firstborn, Charles Mills Manson, a.k.a. Jay White, for people. Right. So, and, and this is first wife is Rosalie Willis. What right. kind of information and what? What kind of surprises and what kind of information did you elicit from Jason Freeman and those interviews? Well, when we were doing this research, one of the areas I personally found really intriguing and and least it too was what happened now you know, we hear a lot about his quote unquote family. Well, those are not his blood relatives. Those are people he troubled souls he picked up along the way. What about his real family? What about the people who were his people he married and the people the sons that he had. Turned out he had three sons. He had Charles Manson Jr., who you mentioned as Jay White, who went on to have Jason Freeman with a woman who he was not married to, and actually initially tried to claim that it wasn't his son and fought not to have to pay any kind of child support, and she took him to court, and there was a ruling, and I have the court documents, which basically show that this woman, Sean Freeman, met Charles Manson Jr., who was going by Jay White at the time, in a small town in Ohio, and he complained that his mother, you know, had a boyfriend, and I think maybe she was on her second husband by then, or third husband, I mean, because there was a, the white was his stepfather. That's why he has that last name. So she had moved on already and moved on to someone else, and apparently, you know, he claimed that this stepfather boyfriend beat him, and, you know, he was living on the streets, and so... He moved in with Sean, and then Sean was already pregnant with somebody else's baby, but he hung in there, and they they got pregnant, too. And so then things kind of fell apart because he had some drug and alcohol issues, and he was still very young. But the biggest problem that he was dealing with in the 70s, in the early 70s, was that Charles Manson was on trial, and his picture was everywhere, and they apparently looked alike. And so everywhere he went, he went to go get a job, actually, and he had a couple different Social Security cards. And he had to keep the one that had his real birth name on it, and he had to use that one. So people actually found out who he was. And so they just kept beating him up. So he'd go to a bar, and he'd just get beaten up. So there's a story in the book where the bartender basically breaks a bottle over his head and bleeding, you know? I mean, people, they just they beat him up because he had the same name. So he was very troubled also because he was trying to reach out to Charles Manson, and, and there was no response. So for many years, he was tortured by that, and he told Jason about that. And, you know, after initially 
saying that it wasn't his kid. He still wanted to see him and still wanted to talk to him. But Sean tried to kind of keep them apart because she didn't think it was good to hear for her son to hear all about his father's obsession with wanting to meet his father, who was this notorious murderer. So I mean, there's a lot of stories about that in the book, which I thought was pretty interesting. And the, what's more interesting now, you know, we kept updating the book as, as much as we could until the very last minute while the battle over his rem, Charles Manson's remains was going on followed sure. that every step of the way but we had to ultimately there had to be a, a point where we had to print the copies of the book so i can't tell you how many times that part was rewritten because things kept changing but jason did actually turn out to be a pretty newsworthy figure so he was the one person that i managed to find and and did speak with him numerous times and as i said i wanted to make sure he was who he said he was so i had him send me those documents from the court showing his father's name on the court records and also, ultimately, his, his father ultimately committed suicide. And so, you know, I just thought that that was important to show these are the ramifications. Not only not only did Manson have victims within his own family, these women who have been in prison ever since, that he made kill other people by brainwashing them and convincing them to do it, and actually convinced them that it was their own idea. And that was what they said for many years, that, that he had no responsibility for it because he wasn't there. He physically wasn't there. So he had them believing that they did all this on their own. He wasn't there. They they wanted to please him. And so they all became his victims as well, in a sense. I mean, I'm not taking sides with expressing sympathy, but I'm just saying this is how a cult works. And that's essentially what the Manson family was, was a cult. So not only do you have those people in his wake, you have the victims who were stabbed and mutilated and shot by the family members. And then you also have his own blood family members, one of whom obviously committed suicide because of all of this fallout, you know, genetically and socially, culturally, you know, it, it's sad all the way around. And I thought that was important to include in the book. And I wish that I had been able to uh, track down Michael Brunner. He actually contacted me pretty recently on Facebook because that's actually how I managed to do some of my research was to contact people through some of these secret groups on Facebook and you know, they all know, these people know each other and there's still a lot of people who are still very obsessed with this case. And anyway, he emailed me and, and I just said, well, I wish I had been able to locate you earlier so that we could have interviewed you for the book. And he said, well, that was on purpose. So, you know, he, he kind of uh, lost out of this last round in the uh, estate battle, but he wanted to make sure that his father's remains were not just scattered around for money. And that's essentially what's happening now, which that's way after what happened in the book. But turned out that Jason Freeman really was a very timely and topical story all on his own. But, you know, when I interviewed him at the time, he none of this had happened yet. So we we managed to get good information from him before the spotlight got on him and before there was any documentary, you know, following him around and all of that. So I'm, I'm proud to say that that chapter happened before all this other stuff. We have to mention, though, just for, for those that uh, that uh, Michael is the son of Mary Burner. Sorry, yes. And she's the fourth. First family member, technically the very first family member that Charles Manson met at Berkeley right after he was released federal prison in 1967. He met her apparently on the Berkeley campus where she was a librarian and they started living together. And Lynette Fromm, who everyone knows as Squeaky, she joined them pretty shortly thereafter. So she was number two. And Mary quit her job to go on the road with Charlie and Lyn Lynette and got pregnant. And so Michael Brunner, who basically, you know, in Manson's view, the children did not really belong to any one person. They were kind of, it was a communal living situation and it was going to be a group kind of upbringing. So right. his name has changed a number of times, but ultimately after all this happened and his, his mother had to testify for the prosecution to get immunity and what have you. And she lost basically control over her own child because the child was taken from her and given to her parents. So he was brought up actually by his grandparents, thinking that they were his parents and that Mary was his sister for quite some time. And he knows the truth now. But and he's a really nice guy, actually. You know, just from the emails, he seems really to have the right intentions and doesn't really seem to have a stomach for everything that's been going on with, you know, filling the ashes and what have you. It's just kind of unfortunate. You also provide a more comprehensive understanding of how the family's activities progressed how they began. You talk about the drug burns. I've read a little bit of this, but again, this is the more detailed, again, more comprehensive. 
the drug burns and the nighttime creepy crawlers were in preparation. This is a, a form of training of sorts. More detailed well, I than people might know. Training. I think the creepy crawly things probably were, but the training was more at Spawn Ranch. So he had, you know, these sessions, he had them working on uh, building them up and trying to get the fear out of them and showing he had text to class on how to stab somebody and do the most damage to human tissue and, and that sort of thing. So the training was like trying to get rid of fear and to teach them that some really twisted ideas about fear and awareness and that you're actually helping somebody reach a, I don't really understand it to be honest. Somebody might differ with my interpretation because I, I honestly don't really understand this. There was this whole crazy idea about fear and awareness and love and it was very odd and that they were not real people. That, that when they were actually stabbing these people, Tex Watson later told the psychiatrist I was able to get a hold of his uh, psychiatric records. That he, he said he didn't feel like they were real. I heard Charlie's voice in my head telling me what to do, and I, everybody was running around. And to me, it sort of sounded like a cartoon in his head because he's on hallucinogens, and he's been on hallucinogens for quite some time. And so they they basically found that he had organic brain damage, and so he was out there, you know, stabbing and sh and shooting everybody. And he said he was basically making happy noises and grunting. And it just the whole thing was just surreal. The way it was so horrible. It was it was very difficult to have to dive into this very violent mindset to get the those scenes written. It was just well, really not pleasant to. I don't usually get involved with writing books that are this violent, but we couldn't really avoid that in this case or it would no. not be telling the truth you know yeah and it's it exposes the mindset which is so important to not to understand this because it's beyond comprehension right but to understand what they were told and like you talk about this fear thing fear will make us love more and then with yeah, more fear true. more love so it's all nonsensical nonsensical it really really makes sense you know i mean but but the thing was, you know, he gave them so much LSD and he told them this stuff and they thought he was some, you know, mystic. You know, he was Jesus Christ and he was preaching and they were just going to listen and they were going to do what he said. And they want, you know, they wanted to shock the world and they did. But very much like a cult, they had some of the girls not as compliant. And then so when this, when Charlie picked out the people to do these murders, he picked out the people that were not going to, as you write, not going to disobey in any way. They were going to follow orders implicitly. And well, that's when he thought, I guess, at the time when he picked him, yeah. But I mean, Linda Kasabian did not follow all the directions, obviously, and she left. She left the scene and she was outside just screaming, Stop, you know, don't do that. And basically, Susan Atkins was like, It's too late, you know, and Tex Watson ignored her. And the next night, Charlie told her to go kill some other person and someone she used to be involved with, I guess, and told her told her to go to this apartment and go kill this guy. And she purposely ended that it was the wrong apartment in the middle of the night and, and said, oh, no, it's the wrong apartment. So, I mean, some of them, she said she couldn't do it. Yeah. And the other one could. So, and Patricia Krenwinkel, I read, I believe it was one of her transcripts from the parole hearing. It might have been someplace else or an interview with her that she actually did go to the guest house and there was you know, the caretaker was in there and well, she chose not to pursue that. She said she just was so tired by that point. She didn't have anything left in her. And so she could see already stabbed Abigail Folger. Folger. Yeah, on the grass. And so, and it helped, you know, with all the other ones inside. So he was spent. And so he, that's the reason that William Garrison was still alive. He died recently, but his life was spared because yeah. he just couldn't do any more. Very grisly story. You have included a lot, again, more details you've been able to provide about murders that happened before and after. And we know of the, there has been talk at the trial, you say there was nine victims, potential other victims identified, but you say that even Bulagosi at that time said there could have been up to 35. And in this book, you provide some other details about those other victims and their potential, at least. Not up to 35, but other victims other than the nine that were registered or we didn't have really the space in the book to go into as much of this as 
you know, I think we would have liked, but, you know, because it's not proven because it never came out in court and, you know, it's a little problematic, but up and down California, you know, the police in many places were trying to see if they had unsolved cases that were linked to these family members. So there's a, there's a spot in the book where I kind of list some generically in a sentence or two. There were, and I don't remember, to be honest, at this point without looking at the book, if even if they even ended up in that sentence, but I can tell you what from my memory. There were two Scientology students in L.A. who were found, and the reason that a lot of these that they did name and the police did talk about, and there, there was news coverage of some of these, the reason they thought these were linked was because they were stabbed so many times and that that was pretty usual and that's not that's not a common way to kill somebody. And this was about right around the same time in the same general geographical area. There was a, uh, those two students, they were stabbed, I can't even remember, so like 50 times or something crazy like that. There was a, I just did a interview with a documentary last week about Marina Habe murder, which was in December, late December of 68. And Good. She was 17, and her body was found off Mulholland Drive, again, stabbed. And then there was Jane Doe, number 59, whose body was found off, also off Mulholland Drive, and that was in the following November, and they didn't know who she was for 46 years. So, uh, yeah, they, she, she was just pretty recently identified as Reet Jervitson. And she was stabbed 157 times. So that's just crazy. You know, and but see, the thing is, to me, you know, I didn't fight to put more than that into the book because they seem tangential to me. Can't say for sure either way that they were Manson family victims or not. Yes, they were in the same general area. Yes, they were in the same time frame. But Reet Jervitson, the time of that murder, Manson... And the family members who did the other killings were all in jail. <laughs> so I don't know about Tex Watson when he was let go. Honestly, they were arrested in October. If if anything, you know, he was in probably in Texas by that point. So Bruce Davis was still wandering around. And so, you know, there, there are people who are still trying to put these, you know, links together and say that these are related. But part of the reason that they're doing that is because Manson bragged to one of the ranch hands that there were as many as, you know, 35 victims. Susan Atkins and Leslie Van Houten both mentioned the number of 11 murders. Now, we still only know of nine for sure, right? So that's even two more. Then there's a guy out in the desert. His name is Paul Dosty. He's a retired yeah. sergeant, police sergeant, who has made it his life's work, essentially, to use his cadaver dog, who has since passed away, his name was Buster, went out into the desert and this is a dog trained to find not the recently dead, but the old dead. And they can smell these chemicals. And, and these results were confirmed, actually, by scientific devices developed by these, these people. And this is all in the book, too, um, who went out there and basically they were able to detect chemicals that are found in the earth from human decomposition. So obviously they decompensated it's been 50 years, but they are, these, these things are still in there. And the dog alerted at five different places. This is where they were camping out and when they were finally arrested near Barker and Myers ranches in Death Valley. And so they're, Paul Dossi's pretty sure, and so is his partner, Arpad Voss, that there are five bodies out there. There are stories about young kids who were kind of hanging around the family and disappeared very oddly, viciously, didn't come back. So they're thinking that maybe two of them are two of those, and who knows who the other three are. And then, you know, and then there are others that are mentioned in the book as well that could be linked, may, may or may not be. But, there, you know, that's a number that's been out there, 35, and we don't know who the rest are, honestly. So who knows? And Manson went to his, to his grave, basically denying killing anyone. So we may never know. You include the details about Gary Hinman, a musician friend. And it's important because it, it just shows the barbarity of this family to turn on somebody that they knew. And, and even through it is, it's, he almost thinks it's a joke or he's trying to talk these people into that it's ridiculous what they're doing. But this is really chilling information about the murder of Gary Hinman yeah. and also Bernard Crow too as well. Right. How was it result that you've got 
where did you get those results? Are those from the parole hearings or how did that research get you that information? Well, what, what we did with this research is, you know, we perfect it like cold case investigators. And basically it was important was to try to, to say something different if we could, you know, everyone's like, well, why Manson? Why, you know, there's 50 books out there already. And I'm like, well, okay. Normally, when I do a book, they're pretty new, and there may be one other book out there. There's been a lot of news articles. So this really was a huge challenge to try to do something different. So, you know, we purposely did not read Helter Skelter. So I don't want to be, like, accidentally copying somebody else's stuff. So we just basically tried to get all of the original source materials. So so we could, you know, look at it and review it and come up with our own conclusions. And that way, and I didn't, didn't interview... We didn't interview Vincent Bugliosi because he was dead. And the, that's the other thing with the challenge of the, the research in this case. We didn't have access. I have a miracle to have this much detail, to be honest, but I've had a lot of practice. And, and this was even brand new approach because it was so difficult. The LAPD and the LA County Sheriff's Department would not cooperate. I initially thought the Sheriff's Department was going to let us look at, they said they had 30 boxes of photos and reports and stuff that that I come in with my copy machine and start to work. And then next thing you know, I'm county council put the kibosh on that. And I'm getting a you know, call from a lieutenant saying, no, sorry, no. And I'm like, really? Oh, I thought we were going to come. No, no. So, you know, it's a mystery to me. Why, if we're doing a historical book and we're trying to be accurate and thorough, why can't we look at stuff that's sitting there? You know, I haven't had that problem with other cases I've written about. You know, I've got a judge, prosecutor, whatever I need, you know, they'll talk to me. But in this case, people were either dead or they said no. So it was very, very difficult. So what ended up finally happening is I managed to meet somebody in one of these, like I said, these Facebook groups who said, hey, you know, you should try the DA's office. I never have gotten information from a DA's office unless it was really? an ongoing trial or something. And then, you know, they've got a case going and they want to help the media and author, you know, that's, they will. But not after the fact. I've never really, other than interviews, I've never thought to go to get documents or whatever. But in this case, that's what that was. They were the keeper of the documents. So what I ended up getting was some some discs of information, and they were basically all the exhibits and pictures, which were not reproducible. They were pretty bad. They were mostly Xerox copies of photos and that sort of thing. But a lot of the stuff, and then there was like partial transcripts, partial grand jury transcripts, partial trial transcripts. And the main problem is they were all watermarked, which meant if you printed them out, you would have big gaps on your paper. So it couldn't use a copy machine, you know, regular printer. And they weren't searchable either. So basically I couldn't do a keyword search and they were not organized or indexed. And so there was a massive number, you know, just I don't know how many thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of trial transcripts, but a lot of them were missing. So honestly, this was the biggest challenge to try to make sense of all this and under deadline. But the Gary Hinman stuff, there was a lot of detail, actually. Mary Brunner testified to the grand jury and um, she testified she testified to the grand jury. I might be remembering that wrong. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, she was at the grand jury and then she also gave interviews which were included, I know, I'm sorry, the two detectives that interviewed her, they testified before the grand jury, and that's where I got a lot of, a lot of that. And then she also had an interview with, um, what's his name, the original prosecutor who was taken off the case, Aaron, or I can't remember his name. Anyway, there were, the, on that, on those various discs from the DA's office, there were little treasure troves of pretty detailed information which then, you know, were able to craft into a scene, which was pretty detailed. And so, and that way, you know, I didn't read anybody else's book to say, you know, that re- that's going to be very similar to so-and-so's book because I don't, I don't know how other people work, but that's, yeah. you know, you take a lot of stuff from a lot of places and you weave narrative, narrative nonfiction together. And that's what we did in this case. And so that was the product of, that's the technique. Thank God it was on those discs. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, Good. yeah. And we went you... to the parole hearing for Tex Watson, and she met Gary Hinman. Absolutely. Yeah, and so, you know, we talked to her too. 
for something you know more current and a little bit more of the family background. You you include right in the beginning of the book uh, that Charlie's in Corcoran State Prison where he spent the last bunch of his years, thirty of his last years of, of his all of his prison stint. But you offer that you introduce a young woman at Charlie gives a name Star Manson. Tell us a little bit about Afton Elaine Burton, the seventeen year old, and why you included this story and what what is included in this story in your mind. What does it illustrate or demonstrate? Well, one of the sources that I found was uh, in the prologue. There's a woman who's not named. I was able to interview her. And so she told me quite a bit about what happened that day. First person eyewitness, you know, account. And the other nice thing is when I wrote Lost Girls and interviewed John Gardner, this was sort of a weird thing (laughs) that happened, but I arranged to go on a Saturday to interview John Gardner, who was in the same unit as Charles Manson. And his mother told me that Charles Manson usually had visitors on a Saturday. So I purposely went on a Saturday to try to see if maybe Charles Manson might be in the visiting room when I went to go interview John Gardner. And they were actually friends for a while. In fact, Charlie was telling John Gardner, hey, you know, you ought to sell some of your stuff online. You can make some money that way, some of your, you know, belongings or whatever. And that ended up turning into a whole thing where John Gardner autographed a copy of Lost Girl, which caused all this commotion. And he did it on the page that was dedicated to the victims. And it was just like, oh, God, John Gardner, why did you do that? (laughs) Honestly, I did not. You know, and it was being sold on a murderabilia site. But basically, they were friends. Uh, Charlie Manson had John Gardner read his mail and and sign his name. Because Charlie had reading problems. I'm pretty sure just my layman's diagnosis that he probably had either dyslexia or some sort of reading disability because he wasn't really able to read. So we had other people. But anyway, I had actually been in that room. So I had this woman who I interviewed and I had already also been in that room. So it was, I was able to create this scene from, you know, first person observation. And so, We thought that that was an important scene because, number one, it showed that even at his age, I think at the time he was, what, something like 79 years old, I think, the the day that that visit happened. And she was 27, I think, or 24, I can't remember, 20, probably 20. But, you know, he was more than three times her age, right? So, basically, that was the point. And he was still able to influence young women. Even with the way he looked, you know, and I saw pictures of him and he was not handsome. You know, he was, you know, kind of, you know, kind of cute and mischievous when he was young. And, you know, he got a lot of women. But a lot of the women that he that he got into the family were kind of homely looking. If you look at the pictures, there are some pretty ones, but mostly he really, you know, Patricia Krenwinkel, not pretty. He was, looked like, kind of looked like a boy, you know, or a man. And so, anyway, Star Star was drawn to him when she was only 17. She heard about him from a friend for his environmental activism. And so she basically moved across the country to Cochrane so that she could visit him. So they started writing letters, and then she moved there. And, you know, they were together for, what, seven years, and they were supposed to get married. He went and got them a, a marriage license so that they could actually get married in the prison. And so... We think that was pretty significant to show the dynamic and that he was still at it and still able to do it. And also because I just thought that that was such a poignant moment where they're dancing together in the visiting room. It's very, very visual and just stuck in, stuck in my head. And thought I just thought that the readers would really relate to that somehow. And she, he became, you know, his... He was one of the very few important people that he could rely on and depend on to do his work on the outside. And so there was another guy named Gray Wolf who smuggled in some cell phones to him and finally got caught enough times that he was banned from the prison, couldn't come back anymore. 
she could still come. And so he was working on the ATWA website, which was something that Sandra Good had and her partner had started some years earlier. Right. Basically, you know, Manson saying that the same thing that he said before, which is that the rich white people are destroying the planet. And look where we are today. <laughs> So, you know, it, you know, and, and there was the whole thing about ATWA was it's a nonprofit, it's a C one a five oh one C three that she and and this guy Grey Wolf uh set up basically, you know, on Manson's behalf, but Manson is not mentioned anywhere. So the whole thing about putting her in the book was number one, to show that Manson was still capable of getting young women and influencing them. Number two, that he could get them to fall in love with him and do what he said. Number three that he still had people on the outside doing what he wanted them to do. And in this case, you know, change his image, tell everyone that he was wrongfully convicted, you know, like a PR person almost, you know. Sure. And then, you know, he wanted them to plant trees and do things like that. So I thought it was, I thought she was pretty important. And I was not able to get her to talk to us. Uh, I tried. I went through various people who all knew her, called her on the phone just kept saying no. So I did find, though, some interviews with her online where I could actually hear her speaking and I could, you know, we could quote her directly using her own words. And there were, you know, some, obviously a lot of news articles and media attention on her and Rolling Stone and various other places. So she was the most recent of his women, you know. So there you have it. You talk about before the Gary Hinman murder, that Mary, Bobby, and Sadie had no history of violence. And then in the book, you go into even more detail than I've read in, say, Diane Lake's book about the techniques, how he started, how brainwashing. We've mentioned brainwashing, but what are the details of brainwashing? And that's what you provide in this on how it, it started and how it became. And then what I found very interesting, too, is that the people that were seemed to be reluctant when they tried to leave like Katie. They right. were, Manson in, instituted a law that no one could leave alone. So he didn't trust those people that didn't trust him 100% as he became more paranoid and as he became more delusional about this idea of going underground in Death Valley and, and his idea that the Black Panther, the black man would rise. And so you provide right. more details of exactly how he seduced these women and these men. Right. A couple other things, though, that I think are important to mention. We tried to, to really get down to a real analysis of motive. So part of the reason, it, and it took a while to get this right, but to kind of reorganize the book until it, this made sense. And the, what we ended up deciding is that doing it strictly chronologically so that these murders that people really don't know about, the, you know, it's not like nobody knew about it, but I'm just saying they're not the ones that people commonly think of as Manson murders, the Gary Hinmanman and the attempted murder of Bernard Crow, and then the one after, which is of Shorty Shea, the ranch hand. These are, you know, the not the high profile murders that everybody thinks of, you know, with regard to this case. But when you read them and the dominoes start following falling and you can sort of understand that, you know, this helter skelter thing that Bugliosi focused on in court in order to win this case, yes, there was there was something the helter skelter idea where yeah they, they're going to go underground go out into the desert and this is charlie's crazy idea which is actually not even his own original thought you know it's based on his his ideas melding the beatles lyrics and the parts of the bible and the krishna vent cult which operated or what was left of it operated actually just a few miles away from spawn ranch which also you know the the guy krishna venta also talked about taking people out to the desert to this bottomless pit and there would be 144,000 chosen people and you know this is all from the bible so all these rantings that Manson told the family and that that Bugliosi this was how he was able to get Manson convicted of murder as part of the conspiracy since he was physically not at most of these murders right. we really wanted to get to motive and and in order to understand that there was more than one motive, that's why the Gary Hinman, that's why the Bernard Crow, that's why those early murders are important because it shows, you know, some of these other, these other theories that are, they're not really theories, they, they are other motives that, that play into this that, that just did not come out in court. So we thought that was very important. And so it shows when he, 
when they, they go there to the Hinman house to go get money so that that'll subsidize the, the move out to the desert. And he didn't have any money. So they end up killing him. And, you know, initially, Bobby Beausoleil is the one who actually stabbed Gary Hinman. He's changed the story a number of times, but, you know, he claims he called up the ranch and talked to Manson, and Manson said, you know what you need to do. And so he stabbed him. Uh, but, you know, the thing was that these other murders, there are people in the family who say, well, we did that so we could get Gary, we could get Bobby Beausoleil out of jail because he was being held on the murder of Gary Hinman. And if we made it look like the Black Panthers did these other murders by painting these messages in blood of pigs and rise and helter skelter like they did at uh, at the Tate and LaBianca houses, we can show that, make it look like there's somebody still out there who, who actually did this. And, you know, Bobby was in jail when these other murders were committed. So, you know, it's a whole other motive for why not just Helter Skelter, which is pretty crazy set of, you know, ideas as as a way to, to you know, make these people do these crazy things that are seem pretty inex- inexplicable why that would be a motive. So it, it's just part of the big mix. And so, you know, talking about each of the murders and then, and how they were done and in detail, and the drug burn with Bernard Crow that Tex Watson did which Charlie ended up being involved in as well, and he ended up shooting this guy in the stomach, had to be included in the whole case because it showed that Manson was capable of shooting somebody since he wasn't at all the other scenes. And by now I've forgotten your original question. Yeah, well, that's the that, a statement basically, but you, you've covered a few things here, certainly with that. No, I mean, that's what I what I was trying to get elicit from you too was that the purpose of that was to show the mindset right. Even before the Tate and La Bianca murders, right. And then I guess I guess one other place that I was going to go is the brainwashing you had mentioned earlier. How how that happened and and why. And I I want to, I want to get to the mental illness because Lisa and I really felt that that was important. That that really has not been explored as much as as we think it should have. Uh, you know, and this happens a lot in trial cases even today, where the prosecutors always say. You know, this this defendant is evil. Well, yes, these were horrible, heinous, brutal killings. But, you know, if you're someone like me who has a psychology background and has covered prisons and mental illness and how addiction often plays into killing, you know, the guy has been, what is, until he died, classified as a mentally ill inmate. He was at Vacaville. For a dozen years, he was in there with all these crazy people. He was diagnosed with aspects of schizophrenia. He was paranoid. He had personality disorders. And on top of all of that, he took all those crazy drugs. And so, you know, was he crazy or was he crazy like a fox? I don't know that it matters, but I mean, if you listen to him, you know, his ideas kind of flow into each other. There was a guy when I went to UC Berkeley, he was called the polka dot man. And I sat down and I talked to him one day because, you know, I was a psychology major and I was really into all this and fascinated by all this. And I sat down and talked to him one day and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm schizophrenic and I don't like the way the pills make me feel because I have all this stuff in my head and the pill basically just keeps it all inside my head, but I still have it all bouncing around. And this way, if I don't take the pills, it can come out physically, but the pills keep, keep it trapped. Well, so while Manson was out... You know, he was obviously, you know, not taking any kind of medication for any of these. And even, I think when he was in prison, they did medicate him, at least while he was at Vacaville. And he's talked about that. So, you know, he has a lot of these ideas. And when you listen to him, there's a section in the book from one of his parole hearings, which gives you a really good idea about how these ideas kind of roll into each other when he's talking. And it's almost poetic, but it's also like a schizophrenic. If you've ever talked to a schizophrenic or listened to a schizophrenic, which I don't think most people have, but I have personally, that's what it yeah. sounds like. And so, you know, I, crazy is kind of a bad term, just the way his mind works. And so people thought he was mystical and people were mesmerized by the way he talked and the ideas that came out of his mouth. And that's part of what brainwashing was, especially when they were on LSD, because what he said, what he said became had much more relevance and he, you know, pulled it all together and into this whole crazy idea of going to the desert and 
finding this bottomless pit and this and that. And so when you look at all of those things, the totality of all of those factors together of what he was doing to them with fear, intimidation, with sex, with drugs, with these, you know, mystical, quote unquote, rants about what was going to happen and the fear and the brainwashing techniques and then the classes on stabbing. I mean, these people, you know, basically did whatever, whatever he told them to do because he, he trained them. I mean, if you've studied any kind of cult, that's what they do. They bring you in. Come join the group. You know, these are lost people who are looking for some direction. They're looking for somebody to give them the answers. They're looking for somebody to tell them what to do with their lives, to give their lives meaning. These were a lot of young people who had problems with their parents, with their mothers, with their fathers. Some of them were sexually molested. A number of them, men and women, were, you know, Bruce Davis was was raped and molested when he was young, and, and so was Charlie. Charlie was raped uh, by these kids in prison when he was, not prison, I'm sorry, in the um, institutions when he was growing up, because he was in juvenile facilities from the time he was a teenager until the time he got out and, and met Rosalie Willis. It was the first, he was the first woman he'd ever had sex with. He'd been having sex with boys for, you know, five years before that. But it's really interesting that, you know, he was institutionalized and all of that became part of his whole thing. And the Dale Carnegie, uh, Norman Vincent Peale, Scientology, and then um, Stranger from a Strange Land, Robert Heinland, those concepts, books, and ideas he picked up also while he was in prison. So by the time he gets out, he's got this whole like mythology built up in his mind about the stuff that he's preaching to these people. And I have to say, you know, it must have been, must have been pretty provocative and, and pretty powerful because it, it caused these people to go kill other people. So that, that's a one of the, for you. One of the surprising things is for people, I think, and there's, it's been explored a little bit, but you do that, you talk about it here, is the Terry Melcher producer... Charles Manson is an adequate musician, singer, songwriter. I've even heard the material with surprise, surprised. And, and they were taking him somewhat seriously. If you think, you know, pop guys in the L.A. scene at that time in 68. Uh, tell us about Terry Melcher, The House, and anything that you discovered that was, again, uh, you didn't read Helter Skelter in preparation for this, but what did you find about the Terry Melcher and that motive in that house and that producer? I mean, there's a lot of different theories. There's a lot of different things that have been said. Charles Manson had been to that house before, number one, which I didn't know before I got involved with this book. He had gone over there, and this came out in testimony, expert testimony. He went over there. He had met the guy who owned the house at Dennis Wilson's house. So uh, Tex Watson picked up Dennis Wilson hitchhiking one day, went back to the Pacific Palisade, dropped him off, and Dennis was like, oh, come on inside my house. So he did, and that's how Tex Watson met Manson. Well, so Manson, next thing you know, is he's moving all the, these young girls in with Dennis Wilson because he's like, oh, here's my ticket, right? So yeah. while he was at Dennis Wilson's house, Terry Melcher came over, music producer. This guy who owned the, the house on Cielo Drive, um, his name is Rudy Altabelli, he was over there. He was the talent manager and some other people who were involved in the music business. So, you know, he was hanging around with these movers and shakers in, in the Hollywood movie and music industry. And, and Charlie really, really wanted to be a rock star. He wanted to record his songs and the, he wanted, he loved to sing. He'd written a lot of songs in federal prison. He wanted other people to hear him. And so Terry Melcher, there was another guy who worked for Terry Melcher who was also involved in this story, who basically convinced Terry to come over to the to Spawn Ranch and, and listen to this, you know, unusual group with Charlie Manson, who Terry had already met at Dennis Wilson's house. So he agreed to go over there. And, you know, he listened, and I guess he wasn't all that impressed, but Charlie thought that he had promised him a record deal and then thought that he had reneged on him. So he went over to, he, he knew that Terry Melcher lived at the CLO drive house. Tex Watson also knew 
that Terry Melcher had lived in that house. And Terry had actually borrowed Terry's car, credit card. So, I mean, there's actually more that I wasn't really able to find out that, because there's just so many different theories and I'm not really sure on what's credible and what isn't, but I do know that they knew each other. And so Terry knew, Terry had lived there before Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski, and, you know, he basically gave them, I don't know if it was like a sublease or basically just he moved and said, why don't you guys move in? So Charlie came over in March of 69 and went to go find Rudy Altabelli in the guest house or was looking for him. I don't know what he said exactly, but there was a photographer over there shooting Sharon Tate. And he came out and talked to Charlie, who was just wandering around the front yard. And basically, the guy said, you're looking for whoever's in the guest house. And so Charlie went to the guest house and no one was there. So he came back that night, talked to Rudy, and he wanted to know where Terry Melcher was. You know, he knew he wasn't living there anymore, but he wanted to know where he was. And Rudy wouldn't tell him. Well, when he came over in the afternoon, Sharon Tate actually came to the door and was like, who? What's going on? And so he actually looked her eye to eye. There was actually, you know, he said so he knew who was in that house and he knew it wasn't Terry Melcher. So there are people who say, oh, he went to the house. He told them to go to the house because he knew that, you know, he wanted them to kill Terry Melcher. Well, he knew that Terry wasn't there. So that's not true. But what what we think is credible thing is that, you know, this other statement, which is that he said basically that go kill the people who live at Terry's house now or the house where Terry used to live. Just go kill them and get as much money as you can and then go to every house on the street and don't come back until you have at least $600. And that was the mission that night. And so, you know, there there are people today who are like, well, it was revenge. That's po- probably partially true. Susan Atkins told her lawyers that that house represented a symbol of rejection for Charlie because he felt it that Terry Melcher reneged on him. And, but, you know, more overall, globally, he wanted, he wanted to kill the beautiful people. He wanted to make a statement. He wanted to shock the world. because He felt like the white people were destroying society. And th- that's where this whole race war thing came from. The black people, you know, the Muslim, black Muslims and black Panthers were already out, you know, causing, causing their movement, you know. And so he said, they're already out there doing it. And so they're going to keep doing it. And then we're going to go to the desert. They're going to join us out there in the desert. And then, you know, when they're done killing everybody, then they're going to make me their leader because they're not going to know how to lead themselves. So it's a crazy theory, but there are actually parts of it that that do make sense. But I, I think, you know, he sent them to that house because he wanted to kill the rich, beautiful white people who he knew now occupied that space. And there there may be more to it than that. Mm-hmm. There's also another thing that we mentioned in the alternative theories chapter in the book where Manson has had had later and and since and was still telling friends of his that he went actually after Tex Watson and the girls came back and they told him what happened, he was really upset that they made such a mess. And so he went back that night, later that night, to clean up, quote unquote, and see what his children, quote unquote, had done. And then so there, you know, supposedly he left some glasses there. He moved the bodies around. It's possible that he went there with someone else. We don't know who that is. Because it does say in the police reports that the bodies, Sebring, J. Sebring and Sharon Tate's right. bodies appear to have been moved. So that actually does match what Charlie was saying later. Incredible. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to go on pretty soon. So let's see if you have any last one or two questions. Yeah, you know, the thing is in the epilogue, it was very interesting, and I mentioned it in the introduction as well, that you said the the social and political context that gave rise to Manson is eerily similar to today. How so? Yeah. You know, the whole time that, that we were working on this book, I just kept feeling, and, and I feel it even more so today, that, that we were in 1967. And, and then the longer... The longer this has gone on with this this administration that we have now, it just seems like there's more and more political divide. There's more and more racial divide. I mean, at the time, actually, that we were working on this, there was a lot more of the the um, black men, unarmed black men being shot by the police officers, the white police officers. That was a big thing that was happening while we were working on this, which doesn't 
or not the media is not focusing on that so much. We seem to be more focusing on Russia and global divides now. But, but basically, you know, here's the thing. We have the opiate em- epidemic. So there's a lot of people out there who are in a vulnerable state. There are a lot of people out there who, you know, more and more, this has actually gotten even stronger since, since we were working on the book. More and more people distrust the government. More and more people mistrust the establishment. The conservative and the more progressive factions are factions, you know, that don't, you know, just like they were back, back in those days. It just seems like there's so many of the same kinds of dynamics going on, except today it's much more dangerous because we have the internet, we have social media, we have these Russian bots, we have whoever is putting together these, the propaganda that you can see on, on Facebook where they're drumming up, you know, division and, and trying to pit people against each other and causing chaos. It is the perfect time for an ideologue who has uh, dangerous intention to come in and try to sway mass opinion. And it's happening every day today. So that's why, you know, if you're a student of history, you can see that that history does repeat itself and it's happening right now. And so Lisa and I felt very strongly that we wanted to end the book with that message that, you know, people learn from the past, look at what's going on around you. This could happen again. Manson, you know, Manson was a product of the media. Manson was, you know, people say, oh, even said this himself. I'm a product of Bugliosi. I'm a product of all of you people looking for basically someone to blame this all on. And I became, you know, the icon. And he, he was right. I think he really did manage to be the guy who was easy to blame. And, you know, you look online and who is the most talked about evil killer ever? And it's Manson, always, right? So, I mean... Anyone could step in and do that. And in fact, I think there are people doing that right now. And I won't name any names, but <laughs> it's, a dangerous, it's a dangerous time. It's a perfect storm. I just hope that, you know, that people can really pull together and resist that and, and try to focus on what's real. You know, as cults are made and ideologues prey on, on people who feel vulnerable and hopeless, and they're looking for somebody to make sense of it. They're looking for somebody to tell them what they think is the truth you know, the truth, which is this kind of a leading thought. Absolutely. And I, and I think you would just totally do for, for an afternoon. Certainly. And I also think Charles Manson has the goals that he had once he had this failed musical career, that he would do something else to achieve infamy. I think that is a symptom of a lot of people today that are desperate for any kind of attention. They go out in a blaze of glory like they have nothing to lose. That's why there's so many of these school shootings. You know, they're all these young white men, right? They're not all young, yeah. but a lot of them are. And but most of them are these white men who feel that they have no power. They have no control. Some of them are mentally ill. Many of them are mentally yeah. ill. And they have guns. And Anson, that, that, that was what was kind of interesting about this is he didn't, he didn't do it with guns. He had these people doing it with knives, mostly. So, I mean, it doesn't, you know, I'm not, not going to say I'm pro, pro or against guns publicly, but, you know, it doesn't always involve a gun when, you can, when you're doing something as a mass murder like this. You can use knives, too. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to thank you very much, Caitlin, for coming on and talking about this. Fortunately, uh, Lee Wheel didn't join us. Oh, until right before I called you that she wasn't going to be able to make it, and I know she really wanted to. So her, I'm sure she's, uh, she's uh, she had a, like I said, a personal situation that crept up all of a sudden. So anyway, we both thank you for inviting us on and letting uh, letting me talk about the book. And I hope everybody out there will pick up a copy and, and read it. For those that might want to, do you have a website or Facebook page for this? Tell us about that. Sure. I have a website, CaitlinRother.com. Lee has a Facebook page, Lee Wheel. I also, I have two, an author page and a personal page. People, they're both public. We're both on Twitter. And I'm also on Instagram as well. And there's plenty of, of information out there. And, you know, there are groups, like I said, on Facebook. If you want to know even more after reading the book and your your opinions are, are peaked, there's a lot of people out there with a lot of opinions. <laughs> Absolutely. So there's a little bit of everything out there. Absolutely. 
Again, I want to thank you very much for talking about hunting Charles Manson, the quest for justice in the days of Helter Skelter. Congratulations on a fascinating and fabulous book. Thank you very much. Oh. Caitlin. Talk to you soon. Yep, on the next, next round. Absolutely. Talk to you again soon. All thank right. you. Right. Good night. Uh, bye-bye.